Well, hello and good evening to everyone joining us uh, tonight on our weekly roundtable, amateur radio roundtable. I'm just looking at some of the people. Uh, looks like we've got uh, some visitors in from uh, New Zealand tonight watching, so that's great. This uh, webcast is every Tuesday at 8 o'clock p.m. Central Time. That's uh, about 0200 UTC on Wednesdays. I uh, would like to ask everyone to please help us by telling all your friends about the webcast, uh, posting it on uh, Facebook, and putting it on your email distribution. Uh, tonight, we've got a great lineup for you, uh, and each one of you can join the live video webcast in the second part of the show if you have a camera and a Google Plus account. Uh, we'll provide you a link uh, that will allow you to come into the webcast uh, a little later in the show. Uh, tonight, we, uh, we have a couple different segments. We've got one uh, by uh, uh, Eric William. Uh, you've seen Eric on the show uh, a number of times, Tech Talk with Eric. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think Eric uh, is able to join us tonight, but we're going to go ahead and have his segment. Yeah, we have a video by uh, Eric, and uh, it's a segment on working uh, satellites with just very simple HT equipment. And then we've got a special guest on here, Dr. J. Garlitz, AA4FL, who was on the T-33A uh, the expedition. And uh, we're going to talk more about all the things he did there. You know, a de-expedition takes to a country a lot more than just radios, so we'll talk about that in a little while. Uh, we've got a section on here on vintage equipment and old-timers like me. Uh, you know, I've been a ham for 51 years now, and I've been asking people to send us uh, pictures and, uh, you know, tell a story about when you were a novice or when you got your license, you know, 35, 40, 50 years ago. So we have some uh, photographs on here of uh, some of the old vintage equipment that we used 50 years ago. That's going to be uh, interesting, I think. And then uh, uh, Dan uh, N9LBS is going to join us. Uh, he's going to talk about some very useful Android and Apple apps for ham radio. After that, we'll go into our roundtable. That's where everyone can join in on the webcast. You can actually be on the, the, the video. You can be on the webcast uh, by uh, joining us through the Hangout link that uh, I will send you. And we can have up to 10 people at a time join. So uh, everybody just uh, stay in there, and uh, hopefully uh, there will be some slots open and you can jump in. So we'll be doing the, uh, the roundtable with all of our viewers in just a little while. So first, we're going to talk about working some satellites. Uh, uh, Eric um, William, uh, Tech Talk with Eric, uh, has a cool video he just put together on working the SO50 satellite with a uh, Bofang HT, you know, very low power, uh, simple antenna on it. Um, we're going to show you that video, and I've got a couple other slides that will go along with that. I'd just like to mention, uh, Eric uh, has a live show called Tech Talk with Eric on Monday nights. You can Google it and uh, find it, but it's mkme.org. So uh, let me put on uh, Eric's uh, video here, and let's see if he can work a satellite with a little uh, handheld HT. Hey guys, welcome back. Glad you could join me today. For those of you new to the channel, my name is Eric. Today we're going to go out and see if we can catch the SO50 satellite with just a cheap handy talkie. You can also do this with a scanner uh, or even cheaper versions of these HTs. Basically, uh, for those not aware, there's uh, low Earth orbit satellites going over all the time. Uh, some are audio equipped for ham radio, and the one we're going to catch today is the Sierra Oscar 50. Uh, what I did is I captured three passes of this with my, with my Baofeng UV5R. You'll see in the video that I just manually correct for Doppler, and I'm just using a Nagoya antenna 
This is just a standard antenna. It's not real good for satellite work, but I think you'll be impressed at the results that we achieved. Enjoy the video. of the Sierra Oscar 50 satellite. We got copies from all over North America. Really good clear voice in some cases. Good, uh, good conversation and uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Remember to click the thumbs up down below if you like these type of videos. Remember to subscribe for more amateur radio videos. It's free. Uh, you'll get notified of any of my uploads and I hope you enjoy the future videos. Thanks for watching. Yeah, that was a cool video uh, by Eric. Now, uh, for all you guys that may have not been on here the last couple of weeks, uh, Eric lives up in Canada, uh, up in snow country up there. And uh, he was copying that satellite, and there were quite a number of uh, U.S. contacts being made here that he, uh, he heard. Uh, so satellite is something uh, I got interested in a, a few years ago and uh, did quite a bit of uh, satellite work. It kind of, ham radio kind of runs in phases. You... You, you, you work satellite for a while, and you work DX for a while, and you work something else uh, for a while. But for all you guys that haven't tried it, you really ought to try a satellite. It's an uh, interesting uh, uh, mode. It doesn't require any expensive equipment. As you saw, uh, Eric use a handheld. You can use a handheld to, uh, to work your satellites. Uh, it helps, of course, if you've got a beam uh, you can use. And um, I uh, uh, worked a number of satellites, and also the, the International Space Station is you know, works basically the same way. You know, it's orbiting. Uh, the difference is the uh, low orbit satellites are out about 400 miles in orbit, and the uh, International Space Station is out about 230 miles, I believe. Uh, there's a, a free program you can download. It's called Orbit. Uh, Orbitron, I'm sorry, it's Orbitron. You put your um, uh, coordinates in there, and uh, it will actually tell you when uh, a satellite is going to come over your house. It'll give you the azimuth elevation uh, by minute, by second, and you'll be able to watch and, s and know exactly where different satellites are uh, at any given time. So if you do have a little handheld antenna to take out there, you can point it that direction. Um, again, you don't need it. I've worked a satellite, and I've also worked the International Space Station three times, mobile, driving home from work. And um, here's, a, here's a simple antenna that I had at home. Uh, 
they're not up now, but that's my azimuth elevation antennas. It's a, a 440. Uh, it looks like an 11-element 440. And then I've just got a little 5-element 2-meter uh, beam up there. And that's a little azimuth elevation, uh, which I can aim up and, and turn it to different azimuths. Uh, Orbitron, by the way, will interface to many of the new radios, and it will also adjust the Doppler shift in your radio uh, where it follows the satellite. So that's kind of cool. Now, here's the, side, here's the antenna you can build if you want to outside. Uh, here's a picture of me in North Carolina in the Smoky Mountains operating uh, a satellite. And uh, I've got a mobile rig there in the back of the truck, a little 7 amp hour ba battery. And that's a homemade uh, 2 meter 440 Yagi. Uh, the antenna is actually a tape measure antenna. The elements are, are the metal off of a tape measure, and they'll actually fold up. Uh, so let me, let me uh, I've got an audio here, too, of working with Space Station. I'd like to try to play to see, to, just to give you an idea of how clear uh, these contacts can be. So here we go. I'm going to try to play uh, my contact with... Uh, uh, Colonel Doug, when he was a commander of uh, uh, back of the space station back in uh, 2011. November Tango 5, Hotel Sierra. This is November Alpha 1 Sierra. Sierra, the International Space Station. Loud and clear, sir. A1SS, Whiskey 5, Kilo, Uniform Bravo, Tom in Memphis, Tennessee. Whiskey 5, Kilo, Uniform Bravo in Memphis, Tennessee. We've got you loud and clear aboard the International Space Station. Greeting to you. Okay, I uh, hope you heard that. But that's, uh, that's an example of how clear these contacts can be uh, through satellite or through the space station. So uh, that's, um, uh, that's just a, a segment I wanted to uh, show you tonight on uh, working satellites and maybe you'll get interested. I know uh, Eric has a lot more videos uh, on, on that subject. Hopefully we'll have Eric back next week, and he can uh, 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 give us some more uh, information. Okay. I know, I know. All right, we're going to try to get uh, Dr. J on here. Let's see if I can do this. Okay, very good. Okay, well, we've got Dr. J on here. Uh, let me tell you a little about Dr. J. Uh, if I can find the right pictures here. Okay. Here we go. I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. J. Uh, Garlitz. He's AA4FL, lives down in Florida. And uh, Dr. J is a dentist. He's from Hawthorne, Florida. And he was uh, licensed uh, back in 1972. He's the current trustee of the University of Florida Club Station. Uh, he's held quite a few uh, international calls, but he's been uh, a 3D2FL uh, in Fiji. He's been a T30L from uh, uh, Tarawa and a T33FL from uh, Banaba. And I may not be pronouncing those right. He can uh, correct me here in a minute. Uh, so tonight, he's going to talk a little about the T-33A de-expedition in uh, Banaba. Uh, for awards, man, I was looking at his awards on his, 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 uh, his uh, QRZ page, and he has so many awards, I can't, I, I can't list them all. 8-band DXCC, DXCC, DXCC phone, DXCCCW, the XCC Digital. He's got multiple worked all states, including uh, on 160 meters. And uh, while he was down uh, on the T33A uh, the expedition, he also uh, provided dental services to a lot of the locals uh, on the island. So um, I'm going to see if I can bring, uh, bring Jay in here. All I can do is find it, find the right button to push. 
All right, I think you're on, Jay. How you doing? Oh, let me let, let me get a little volume on you. There we go. Good evening to you and to all your viewers. All right. Well, uh, hey, you got that nice T33 shirt on. Did all you guys <laughs> get one of those? Uh, team shirt, team photograph, sure. All right. Very good. Well, you know, uh, we've got some pictures here we're going to show. And, you know, we had Arnie on here um, uh, last time, and he talked about some of the expeditions that he was on, mainly just in, in general. But uh, you... Uh, you were with Arnie. Arnie and you were together on the T-33 uh, a expedition, and I'm sure he's probably watching now, so you got to be careful what you say, okay? <laughs> all, all right. So, hey, let's talk a little about that. I, I, I've got pictures here. Um, let's just jump right into it. Now, hey, first let me just say, I think you were, there was a request for a dentist to come to the island. Is that correct? And actually that request was was forwarded by Arnie, and Arnie knew about that, but the Tribal Council requested the dentist and contacted Medi Medical Amateur Radio Council, a group of hands that are physicians, dentists, people in the medical fields, and when they put out a request for a volunteer, I stepped forward. Okay. And, and there were some other special things happening then. It was a uh, uh, it was a seventh, 70th anniversary, I think, of uh, the uh, uh, battle there during World War II, I believe. It was, and uh, we didn't really plan that. That just happened to work out to be our day of return from Bonava. When we arrived back on Tarawa, it was the 70th anniversary. It was quite surreal to be there. Well, I'm going to put a couple pictures up, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to see and, and kind of, I don't know if you can see that or yeah. not. That's this your is first picture. The, Tell us about yeah. that. Yeah, that's the picture of the – now, actually, we came back in the afternoon, and that was given to me by a friend because they had a sunrise memorial service for the Battle of Tarawa on that day that we returned. And there was a veteran there. There was about 18 Americans there. Unfortunately, the U.S. ambassador was tied up in the Philippines because they had that large typhoon there. So there wasn't a large contingent of Americans. There were some Marines on the island at the time. Uh, working teams still doing ordnance disposal and uh, identification of remains, but to be there was was very special, obviously, and, and you certainly appreciate the service that all the fine individuals did throughout all the different armed forces. And on that day, particularly the Marines. Yeah, you even brought back uh, some sand from the beach. I think uh, didn't you uh, from this trip to? To the VFW or to the American Legion, uh, Legion. we we had a request from one of the Legion members here in Hawthorne, Florida, their post 230. His uncle actually passed away in the battle, the Battle of Tarawa, which is on Biso Beach, on Red Beach to be precise. And he really didn't know much about what happened. He didn't even know the disposition of his uncle's remains. And he asked me to research when I was there, and they brought me, they gave me a plaque to bring. And that plaque was hanging in the airport when all the dignitaries came in. Again, we really didn't plan on the 70th anniversary. It just so happened to work that way on the calendar. But what a special happening. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's uh, put the second picture on here. Let's see what this is about. I guess that's the, that's the memorial there. I made a collage for the, uh, for the member. Uh, of the American Legion and for the American Legion, and that's a, it's sort of a summation of the trip. And I uh, included sand from the beaches in that collage, and I was gratified to do that. It, it was uh, it was a wonderful again opportunity to to recognize a veteran and to recognize veterans in general. They well, gave so much. Well, that's great. Let's see what's coming up here next. Uh... Oh, there's, there's, there's the operating position. That's, I wanted to see that. <laughs> That's the sideband station. Uh, the, the, the infamous or famous Bonaba House. You know, uh, Kiribati became a country in 1979, and Bonaba was an island that was mined by the British Phosphate Corporation, and at that point it uh, was given to the independent country, back to the country. So very interesting and complicated. One of the reasons why I went on this, the expedition when the opportunity crossed my desk, and I have never been on a expedition, this is my first. So you might say I picked a wonderful one to participate in. 
nice people, good location, you know, a wonderful trip in general. But but certainly that uh, that was a very unusual opportunity in the social in the the geopolitics of the area. I'm a university guy. So there's all kinds of interesting things going on outside of amateur radio that involved that trip. And I was glad to choose that one. But that Bonaba house was like a 0 0.5 hotel. I mean, it was yeah, it, it was old and in disrepair, and we were very fortunate to be able to use it. No electricity, no running water, of course, but uh, it gave us a nice place to set up the so side. The star rating, the star rating here was a 0.5 on the star well, scale, that's, right? That's our joke. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, it looks pretty nice. I, I don't think we asked for that. <laughs> so, so you were offering, you know, hey, what's the best station to operate for in a de-expedition? 20 meters, man, it must be hot and heavy and going all the time and pile-ups. And uh, how did you luck out and get that? <laughs> Actually, uh, when they put in the request for the band, I, I put in a request for everything but 20-meter phone. <laughs> and oh. I ended up working it a little bit because I was the relief operator. We, we had a wonderful the expedition, fantastic operators. They're all great role models for me, being my up being my first. One other person was his first too, and being that there were 19, that was a, a number that just didn't divide into teams of three. So there were 18 people in the six teams of three, and I was the relief operator, which I needed to be because half the time I was actually uh, doing dentistry and working with school children. Everybody that was on the de-expedition did more than just amateur radio. I don't, I don't want to give the impression that it was me. I mean, I did the, the dentistry, and I had others help me set up for that and work with the school children. And others on the de-expedition bought soccer balls for donations, and they bought shoes. They worked on radios to fix them, worked on computers. Even the boat that we traveled on, we put in a radio for them. So it really was a multifaceted volunteer effort. So I don't want to dwell on the dentistry, but it was just a very unusual opportunity for the dentistry. And really, if you think about it, and you think about bringing equipment somewhere, who can realistically transport equipment for that distance in a financially responsible manner? The de-expedition has a shipping container. To me, that's a no-brainer volunteer opportunity. It was leaving from Long Beach anyway, so it was just a matter of getting the tools and the equipment, and I even was able to get some volunteer uh, donations of school curriculum it was being sunset from the local school board. And all that went in the shipping container at no additional cost. Yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's one that. of the things that I wanted, I, I kind of uh, uh, hinted about at, at the beginning of introducing you. You know, there's a lot more to these de-expeditions than just setting up a radio and working. Uh, you guys do a lot of work uh, for the... Uh, the, the locals, I mean, from medical to, like you said, you install radios and boats for people. You really make their life better, and I, I would imagine they're glad to have you come come down here. I think most of the expeditions try to do something for the locals. And again, I'm not a seasoned de expeditioner, but from what I've heard from others, I, I've heard they've taken on projects to help in whatever way was needed. It doesn't always in, involve high levels of population because some of these places don't have a lot of people that live there. It may be, say, uh, uh, monitoring equipment that they, they work on uh, for weather. There's, there's all kinds of ways that amateur radio operators, which, which are ingenious groups of people and, and really know how to, to make use of resources, get things done. I mean, think about amateur radio. Think about volunteerism. Who do you think of as an excellent volunteer, an amateur radio operator? That's who you on in a time of need. Well, here's a, here's a picture of uh, operating at night. Now, are you? In, you're. This is outside, isn't it? This picture. But there was a, There were two operating locations. Uh, the island is a very interesting island. There's 33 islands in the country. This particular one's the only one with any elevation. This is the top of the island, 260 feet up. There's a soccer field up there. And of course, we really did not know till we got there a lot of the details. We could do our best with Google Earth and talking to previous teams. But this was a soccer dugout, and they had a tarp, and they threw the tarp over it, and that became the operating location. So the, you were just out in the open here. Now, what about what about bugs and things like that? Did you guys <laughs> get attacked by any kind of bugs or anything? I mean, I see a bright light here and it's dark. I, I, I actually did not send you a slide that I always get kind of a joke at when I'm making presentations because there were geckos there. So I always tease that we had our own uh, Geico insurance agent along with us. You'd be, oh, yeah. you'd be setting code yeah. in the middle of the night, and all of a sudden the gecko would stick his head out right by your key. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, there really weren't. Uh, there weren't. There weren't much of it. It was no problem to me. Uh, mosquitoes? Well, we we really didn't run into to many mosquitoes. We were there during the dry season. We all came prepared. We we knew what to look for with mosquitoes. But I think that would have been more of a problem in other areas. Fun about it wasn't much of a problem. Not when we were there. All right. So, uh, what's this building right here? It, that's the European Union built a medical clinic for okay. the, the country, for Caribous. Uh, and when you look at the spelling of the name of Caribous, it's spelled like Caribati, but their they're dialect, they only have 14 uh, uh, consonants and vowels in their in their language. So mm -hmm. uh, the, the wor a lot of the words are, are sounded out different. So uh, Caribous, that, that, that was built by the European Union. I don't know how many years ago, not that many probably within the last five. There's an HF antenna in that photograph. You can probably see the ballot and the, the color. Oh, yeah, yeah. I just see it hanging back here. They but use that for communicating with Tarawa 250 miles away from medical clinic, back with the department, with their uh, health department back there. So how far was it, if you guys, now on this island, the T-33A, uh, the expedition, uh, how far was your closest real hospital or medical help if you needed it well, actually, Tarawa, it would have been a 48-hour uh, boat ride each way, 40-hour one way, 48 the other if there was any kind of emergency. Now, Arnie was with us for our team. Yeah. So we had a bad position. And but it was, uh, it was a 48-hour boat ride from where you guys landed, I guess, uh, uh, to, to this spot. That, that is just, that's a long boat ride. And seeing dental patients, obviously, if you have an emergency, it was a little bit of a... Rest you, you brought a lot of uh, had a lot of donations. The medical amateur radio capital yeah. had emergency medical supplies. The University of Tennessee donated. So yeah. one BEW uh, went ahead and had those sent to me. So yeah. we, we came with with some, but still, you know, a major emergency, of course, a health emergency would have been a, a big issue. Had it been one of us, uh, I'm sure we would have found a way to have gotten help. All right. So when you were there, you actually you set up shop. To do dental work because they they needed a dentist there, and uh, you uh, you carried your your instruments and whatever material you could in your uh, in in the containers, and I, I suppose you uh, also then used some of the uh, uh, the other supplies that maybe they had locally uh, to set your uh, dental clinic up. Right. Let me go to the next picture. Okay. Here's uh oh looks like you're working on somebody here. I am, and, and they made that table for me. Uh, again, it was very hard to communicate. There's no internet on Bonobo. Uh, there's almost no email. On, on rare occasions, you can get something through. Even from the government, they can't get anything through. It's, it's, it's problematic at best, and to find out any details was almost impossible. We did have uh, uh, we did have one lady with us who was uh, was born in Tarawa, and she made the trip with us. And she was, uh, if it wasn't for Annie, I don't think we would have had a successful day expedition because she was there to negotiate everything. And uh, they were appreciative to have me there. I, uh, the, the young lady that uh, is in the foreground there that assisted me was a family planning aide. There was no nurse on the island when I got there. Usually that clinic is occupied by a nurse. But she helped me and showed her how to sterilize instruments. And she already knew the basics for that anyway. And she wanted to go to nursing school, and she did. Well, I heard, I heard the first day you were open for dental business, you didn't have but a few people in line out there. Uh, but, but later, uh, they, you had plenty of customers, didn't you? Yes, and that's uh, Rotaria, the young lady that's there, told me I asked her because when I brought all the equipment over about three or four days before, I asked her to set up patients for me, and there were only a few, and I was expecting to have a heavy schedule, but later that materialized, and she explained it to me that, they were scared. They did not know that dentistry could be pain-free. And once they heard that we took care of the pain before we did the work, uh, we, then they came out in numbers. And actually, it got to be such a long line. At that point, we went in and scheduled the whole week out. So it, oh, was, yeah. it was fun. It was a nice group. They were very, very appreciative. Wonderful people. And oh. they weren't all from Bonobo. Only about a third of the people on the island are Bonobo. Some are from Tarawa, other places in Caribous. Some are from other countries, Papua New Guinea, you know, many, many places in the Central Pacific. 
So the next picture I'm going to show, I must warn, warn our uh, viewers that it could be graphic, okay? Uh, the first time I looked at it, I almost fainted, but I, I was able to control myself. Uh, here we go. I tried to keep it tame, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Guys. That's all right. That's all right. So well, it actually makes a point. Yeah. That, that's the need. <laughs> that's the need right there. That's uh, neat, and there was a lot of it, and uh, there was a lot to help out. And you're doing this in 90 degree heat, uh, no running water, no electricity, no X-rays, uh, no real way to diagnose other than your instincts. And wow. uh, it, fortunately, it all worked out, and everybody was taken care of well, and there were no emergencies. There were one or two cases that were sweated a little bit, but for the most part, the teeth were begging to come out because they'd been diseased for so long. And the picture that you saw showed that. That's what teeth look like when they're heavily diseased. The wow. other one was a child that had a developmental problem, and in development it would have never have been addressed. There would have been nobody there to help. And I went ahead and took care of it, and now they can continue developing and have a normal functioning mouth. Well, that's, that's great. That's just another service that Ham Radio uh, brings to people. That's, uh, that's really, really good. Uh, here's a picture. Uh, this is a school. You're getting toothbrushes and everything here. Yes, two specials, floss. Uh, about 25% of the population are children. And uh, you know, the bottom ends want to claim their own territory and maintain it, so they have some families there. They have a tribal structure. Their, their main island, actually, of their culture is near Fiji. It's one of the Fijian islands. They were repopulated there in 1947, so phosphate could be mined. And they used to have quite a bit of a water problem on that island. Now they don't think have some desalinization. But yes, we worked with the kids, fought and left other supplies for them too. There were other hands in that picture. I wasn't the only one of the team members there. Mm -hmm. I was just standing in front of the children. We did other things with the school children. It wasn't just toothbrush and floss instruction. Really, really cute kids. We, all, as the group, the group of us had a chance to see them on the classes and see them learn both in Gilbertese and in English. So, Jay, is this the island that the British moved everyone off of? This is a island that they moved everyone off of. I don't know if they've done that in other areas. Okay. I, mean, I don't know if it's the British government as much, but the British Phosphate Corporation oh. wants to mine that. And they, it's not that they just moved everybody off of it. I mean, there were issues there. Mm -hmm. There were issues with water. You'd have to go and read the history. There's lots of wikis on Bonobo. But they made a beautiful replica island for them, took all five of their villages and reproduced it. Oh, that's cool. In that location. And you, so a lot of the people then uh, were actually moved, and not many came back. I think it had a population of maybe 3,000 or so, and then uh, a small number came back to, to this island. Is that correct? Well, it went from about 6,000, and now if there's 325 people on the island, not all of them are bottom of it. But uh, 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 good portion of them are, mm -hmm. at least a third. There's all kinds of statistics uh, from the government of Kiribati on, on websites. And I have links for them. There's some on the T33A site. Yeah. And there's, there's plenty of other links that are available. If people are really interested, just email me. And I'll answer any questions or chat later. And we'll, we can chat and answer them in the chat room. But uh, you know, the uh, the, the island is uh, not heavily populated. And remember, there's no commercial transportation to the island. There's no stores. And there's no ways to get provisions. And, and it's a 48-hour boat ride back. And families do go back and forth periodically, and they come back with food items, and they come back with other basic necessities wow. of life. And it's not like they're that isolated. I mean, they live very nice lives. I mean, they have USB sticks where they watch movies on laptops. Some of them have some solar power for that, for at least the small electrical drain equipment. And it's not a terrible way of life at all. Mm -hmm. It's not that isolated, but it's definitely different than what you and I would be accustomed to. So the elevation, you said, was only a, a couple hundred feet. Uh, it, out in the middle of nowhere there, I, I, I guess the the weather can get pretty bad. Probably not when you were there, but well, what's, what's the chances of that place uh, getting washed away out there? Well, this 260-foot elevation. They're uh -huh. not getting washed away, but the rest of the country is. Okay. I, ch I chatted with some friends on Tarawa two nights ago, 
and asked them specifically that question and uh, the, the seas, seas have been high lately and they have causeways that are basically at sea level connecting their islands and the roads are washing out the hospital they told me had sheets of water flowing through it it's a problem and in, in the future the days are probably numbered i know global warming is a little more complicated so no matter what the cause of it is but in terms of what areas actually will increase in sea rise and which areas won't it's not so simple it's not uniform from what i understand but right. uh so uh, I was going to ask everyone here uh, to send any questions. I've been trying to check the chat room out. Uh, there are people are making comments about uh, your trip and some of the uh, things that we brought up. If anybody has any questions for uh, Jay, please uh, uh, put them in the uh, chat room here. And when we get through with the pictures, we'll try to answer your questions. So Jay, let's look at this next picture here. Let's see what this is. Yeah, uh, and N1EMC was one of the co-leaders. He, he came prepared with Chinese lanterns, and we took all the kits and rode down to the uh, the harbor. There's one truck on the island. We all loaded in there, and we uh, showed the kids how to light Chinese lanterns and went off into the uh, Pacific with them up in the sky. We had a great time. We had a wonderful evening with the, with the locals. Well, that that's uh, that's cool, and those are beautiful lanterns. And you know, uh, back when I was in college, uh, we set a few of those off, but now I think back, I just wonder how many cities I could have burned down with the, with those things uh, out there where you were, and you just let them go out over the ocean, right? Yeah, they went right out. <laughs> they yeah. went right out to sea. They sure did. Not not much to keep to be in the way there. Yeah. Now here's a, a picture of uh, you sent. Some of the other activities that people did. That that flag activity, the, the school banner activity. Now, I remember being at the Dayton uh, DX uh, dinner and hearing Dave Collingham, K3LP, talk about that. So I'm not sure if that originated with him, but I know he's had a part in it. And there's a school in Fontana, California. They brought the banner. That's, that's one of the ones he works with. And they brought the banner from that school. And in return, they sent one back from Bonobos, California. And Jay, W2IJ, who's on the right-hand side talking to the teachers and explaining the instructions for dealing with the materials, uh, he brought the banner and carried it back. There were three J's on this trip out of 19. You go figure. Uh, we had to call us J2, J4, and J8. I, I understand. I understand. Uh, at, at my work, uh, we, we had an office that had, I think, five Toms in it. No, it was five gyms. It's been a while. It was five gyms. Uh, <laughs> it it, it, it yeah. was good Of course, one, there were two of us that were fours. So J8 was actually K4LZE. That's only because he lives up there. He lives up there in Ohio. There's yeah. The kids with the shoes, Jay arranged to have uh, an organization in Honolulu donate shoes. So it, it, what was not ironic but was gratifying about that, they had just brought those shoes over to the tribal council. Mm -hmm. Within half an hour, they're on the kids' shoes, they're on the feet, walking walking around. There's some of the soccer balls that we brought. That was actually in the SSB station. All right, so here's a question. Uh, let's see uh, Renee nz 9 t is asking uh, what's the main food staple of the people there I see a lot a lot of good questions there the main food staple is seafood uh, there were a lot as we came in we we're seeing flying fish and then we were served flying fish uh, there's lobster uh, you, you from the sea there's plenty of choice they also have papaya on the island and they have some bananas uh, not a lot of uh, not a lot of vegetation on the island. I, I think you meant, we mentioned there was 90% deforested, and that is true. And unfortunately, in 1979, when they stopped mining, you had all this ancient coral. The phosphate was located in between, so you have these sharp 20-foot pinnacles of coral, and it can be kind of dangerous to walk around it. And now what's happening, the vegetation is starting to grow back. So here you've got some greenery at the base of the coral. If you're not careful, you're going to fall in a pit and get hurt with no way to evacuate. We just stayed off limits from those areas. Well, there's one one food I can't live without, and that is peanut butter. If you had to go around an island, could you think you could find a jar of peanut butter anywhere? <laughs> it came came with us. <laughs> oh, it did. It. You took it with you, huh? All right, man. All right. Yeah, they, they were well provisioned. Uh, what wasn't brought from California was picked up in Tarawa. Uh, what other type of humanitarian aid uh, does the island accept besides dentistry? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I, I don't know what people ship to them in a volunteer fashion. It would be whatever their tribal council arranged for. I was only there for two weeks, 
and, and I didn't really uh, go into what their needs are. I guess that could be a little insulting, too, but not that I was embarrassed to ask, but I was pretty much consumed with what I was doing, and they seem to be doing quite well. I'm sure they always need help. I know uh, some of the some of what I did see, the Taiwanese had supplied a truck for the island. I think the Japanese had done a desalinization plant and capable of a thousand liters of water a day. And uh, the European Union, of course, did the medical clinic. So there's obviously activities that go on that are sponsored by governments. And in Tarawa, that's even more obvious in Tarawa, because right now there's Australian teams that are trying to rebuild those coastal roads so they can actually be transported from Little Island to Little Island that are connected by causeways. That's where they're having all the problems with the sea level rise. Well, you got all that seafood there. Now, what, what's the most popular dish? Well, what did you guys eat the most there? <laughs> we, we ate our own food. Uh, oh, did you? We came prepared with provisions, so oh, okay. we had a few cooks with us. We, I, I always thought I was going to lose weight. That was one of the ways my wife told me I could go on the de expedition, but I didn't lose any weight on that de well, so, uh, we were well fed, or at least I was. Uh, it, in terms of local food, the seafood, uh, a little of everything, curried fish. Uh, they they make uh, vegetables. Uh, they have taro, they, wild taro that they have. So uh -huh. you eat well there. They do have some canned items. So they got them from somewhere. It's not canned pineapple. So what's the climate like there? I, I don't know exactly. I haven't looked at the map. Uh, Equatorial, that's uh, yeah. fairly constant between 80 and 90 degrees. It was 90 degrees when we were there during the day and not much cooler at night. Uh -huh. okay. And uh, we were there, of course, during the dry season, so weather wasn't really much of a problem at that point, but they do have a wet season, too. It reminded me similarly of uh, some areas in Florida that I grew up. It was a little drier. I mean, Fiji reminded me of South Florida. The Fiji's a thousand miles south of where uh -huh. we were at. Well, uh, we've already got the peanut butter out of the way. Did you have any Snickers or M&Ms? <laughs> oh, you want things that melt in your mouth? Well, yeah. <laughs> no, so, I don't remember exactly what they bought for candy, but as a dentist, I can't condone it. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, so you said you were there for two weeks, but I, I would imagine this trip probably took a month of your time to get there and back. How, how difficult is it to get there? Well, for, our, for us, we, had, we went in two different teams. Uh, the, there was a, an early arrival team that had to get provisions, which I went a little early. Uh, we all left out of, this group left out of L.A. We met in Fiji, and then we went together as a group from Fiji to Tarawa. And Tarawa is where we met our boat and our shipping container, Tarawa being 250 approximate miles away from the island. And that's where we, we had a, a boat that we had leased for the trip to drop us off and pick us up. But uh, the others came about three days later, so the trip was just about as long for them. It wasn't much shorter. And we, we had uh, four days in transit, and two in, two in each direction. And uh, also we were on the island for 13 days. So it, it ended up being three and a half, four weeks by the time you added all the days together. It was something that uh, being a working person still, it was difficult to do. It's so I, I, I guess probably... Uh, I, uh, the, the I wasn't question. the only young ham. I mean, there was a there was a ham in his mid thirties. There was yeah. one in his forties. There's a question about mail, uh, and it's making me think of a couple more. But I guess they have a mail service. Really, don't know. Don't know. Do they have satellite? Do they have satellite TV? No. Oh man, no radio stations. No, there's one in Tarawa, an FM station. The way I saw there for entertainment was USB sticks. You know, you talk about culture, and one of the reasons why I went was culture, and like in cultural anthropology and such. What they did have on the island that shocked me was they had DJs, and that's when they ever had their dance. And the first dance I saw was actually the hokey pokey. So uh, you know, societies are blending. We're a connected world. There's no lack of intrusion of culture. I heard more reggae there than I hear in Florida. Really? Okay. Well, uh, there's a question. Why didn't you just fly in to an airport there on the island? Wish there was an airport on Bonobo, but none. None. Yeah. How big is that island? Oh, you gosh. Think? I'd have to look up the exact. Uh, it was eight. I don't know if it was square kilometers or square miles. Uh -huh. it, it, I, I guess it's okay. And, it, and it's 90% deforested. So. Uh-huh. 
Okay, let's see. I've got another picture here you sent. Let's see what this is. Um, there we go. There's, there's uh, Arnie. I can't say enough good things about Artie. <laughs> Arnie was, was such a good host to me, and he, he made sure that I, I, I learned and got up to speed with the expedition quickly. And he was also a mentor in other ways, too, being in the medical field. And uh, I, I really enjoyed my time I spent with him, and I try to get together with Artie whenever, whenever I can. I'll be out in California in a few weeks, and I'll see him in March. Yeah, well, that's good. I know he's planning the next de expedition to go on. Right? Have you got anything planned? Do you want to go on another one? <laughs> uh, I, I got a group that's talking about Christmas Island because there's a dental clinic there, too. I've been talking to some of my dental students about it. Oh, you maybe take some dental students with you? We'll see what happens. All right. Well, I'll keep us posted on that, okay? That would be uh, late in 2016. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, here's some cards. These are your QSL cards, I guess, right? Yes, that, uh, I get a chance to do three, three different so locations. It appears to me, uh, I see something in common here, the FL. I would imagine that's Florida. <laughs> well, my AA4 FL call. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I, yeah, well the, yeah, AA4, that's, what's the FL? Is that Florida? No, it's consistent, you know, the prefix and the suffix. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I, they were all available, so. It's not your initials. You know, some people get their initials, but... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, they must not have too many hams over here if you can just go over there and pick your uh, call letters like that. How many hams do you think uh, are, are, are on those islands that you visited? Uh, very not few. Many. Uh, Tarawa, not many. I, I don't know of any local activity on a regular basis from Tarawa. There's the expeditions that come about every year or two. There was one a, a group of Germans that were there, I think, in October, did a fine job from Tarawa. Uh, Ricky, that was with us in Bonaba, had a Brazilian group there the year before. So Terra was not that rare. Bonaba had been many, many years. Ironically, I don't have credit for working Bonaba. It's one of those countries I need for DXCC. I made 2,000 contacts. You haven't worked? Well, hey, there's nobody there to work. There's no one here to work, right? Uh, I'll see, have to wait for next for this. Well, if you had a, like a remote base in Florida, you could have, well, you couldn't have even called in, could you? Oh, man. Okay. I just passed up a chance working the Wake Age the expedition. I didn't cheat. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I heard it. <laughs> I needed Wake, too. So I'll have to wait on those two. Time will come. When I, you know, when I was operating, there were two stations worldwide that worked me from all three locations. You know, I only made 75 contacts from Fiji. I'll so to work all three, I got gave a certificate. I, I yep. thought that That's was... That's what I heard. Cool. Yeah. And, and Zero FW was one of the stations uh, that beat. <laughs> so, uh, All right, uh, tell us about the special recognition certificate here. Yeah, that's what happened. They they worked me from N0FW, and there was a Japanese station that actually worked me in all three of those locations. And the odds of doing that are pretty low, because I said I only made 75 contacts from Fiji. But those two guys worked me from each of the locations when I was there. So I was making my tour of the Central Pacific. They followed me. Well, Jay, uh, man, it's uh, it, it's been a great story that you told. Let's see if there's any more questions in, in the chat room here. Um, uh, you, you really stirred up their interest. They're they're talking about helicopter flights near how to get there. You know, I mean, how to dispose of waste. Now we've already talked about that on the last one. I would you may have even well, you I, had facilities there. I, I did the medical waste a little different. I did carry uh, red containers. I took them back with me to the hospital. Oh, okay. Those of them in terror at the hospital. Okay, so you took that back. Great. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, any other questions for uh, Dr. J here from the T-33A expedition? I've, uh, I've enjoyed talking to you tonight, J. Uh, it's always interesting to hear all the little uh, bits and pieces about these things that aren't necessarily just the, you know, the radio contacts. Uh, if, if you like working DX, I would definitely suggest you consider going on at least one DX position. Uh -huh. It's different thing on the other side. But even if you go holiday style, just to have fun, and go to the Caribbean, uh, there's lots of ways that, that you can, and you can help along the way if that's what you so choose to do in your related fields. Well, okay, uh, Jay. Well, I think we're going to go ahead and uh, move on to our next uh, uh session here on the uh, webcast. We've really enjoyed having you on here tonight. We're going to have to have you back one night, okay?
Well, thank you for having me. Enjoyed being here. And again, good evening and good morning to those in New Zealand. And I hope to, to meet you all on the air. Yeah, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna try to have a uh, uh, a segment on DX or de expeditions uh, every week or so that we can. So we'll we'll have you back on here. Thanks very much for taking your time and being with us. Thank you. All right, that was uh, Jay. Dr. J, I guess I've been calling him, AA4FL. He lives down in Hawthorne, Florida. Well, let's see what we got. Uh, guys, uh, give me a report. Has the audio quality been better tonight than it has been in the last uh, week? So I would just like to kind of get a report on how things are looking, if you don't mind. So let's do a couple announcements real quick. Uh, we need pictures for vintage and old-timer stories for shows. Uh, we're always looking for our interesting segments to have on the show. If you'd like to be on the show, send me an email. We're looking for segments like DXing, digital, uh, you know, EME, satellite, home brewing, whatever. Whatever you've got, we'd like to put you on here. Uh, and, uh, to share it with others. I'd like to ask everyone please join our Facebook webcast group. Uh, there's a button right below the chat room that says join us on Facebook and you'll get all kinds of updates about our webcast and our schedules, where we're going to be. You'll see pictures on there and it's just a ham radio hangout too. You can post pictures on there and discuss other ham radio uh, activities. Uh, so just uh, if you will, click on that button and, and, and join our web, web page. Now, let's talk. Let's have a little segment here called Vintage and Old Timers. I'm an old timer, 51 years as a ham. Uh, I got my license when I was uh, six months old. So, 51 years as a ham. And what I've asked people to do is send me pictures of, uh, you know, their, their equipment back, you know, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. And uh, you know anything interesting in that in that time frame? So I'm going to jump down here to um, uh, we got a, we got some pictures in here from uh, uh, Dan Caesar NI9Y, and uh, here's a picture of Dan right here in 19 I think it's 1972, and uh, looks like he's got a I think that's a Heathkit transmitter there. I'm not sure about the receiver. Let's see. He was, oh, he was first licensed in 1955. Dan NI9Y was licensed in 55. And uh, his first receiver was a 6VE6 regenerative receiver. His first transmitter was a Globe Chief kit, and he built that on the kitchen table. I bet his mother really liked that. And in the pictures here, uh, you're going to see uh, an S19R receiver, and his first antenna was a Wyndham fed with TV twin lead. Uh, let's see. Well, let's see. Let's go to the next picture here. You know what? Uh, I, I, I made a mistake. I made a mistake. I've got to correct it. That's, that's, that's Jay. That is Jay who we just talked to. Uh, my, my photos got out of sequence here. Sorry, Dr. Jay, but this is Dr. Jay in uh, looks like 1972. Uh, so we're going to come back. To, we'll come back to Dan Caesar in a minute. Here's another picture of Jay, Dr. Jay. It looks like he's a little bit older there, and it looks like he's uh, upgraded his equipment a little bit. All right, now here we go. Now we're going to go into. I slipped those pictures of Dr. Jay in there, and I didn't have them uh, loaded in my uh, teleprompter here, so we kind of get out of sequence. So here we go. Here's Dan Caesar right here. This is his grandchildren. Children. And uh, again, Dan got his license in 1955. And look at the granddaughter there holding that tube. I mean, that tube. I mean, do you trust her to hold that tube? I don't know. Man, if she drops it, it's a goner. But uh, again, here, 6BE6 regenerative receiver, Globe Chief uh, kit built on the kitchen table. 
If you look in there, you'll probably be able to pick out that S19R receiver. Uh, let's see. Uh, move on down. Another picture of him here. Uh, let me check, make sure. I, okay. Yeah, here, here's Dan again. Dan here again, uh, operating. Uh, it looks like that was, uh, again, some vintage equipment. I can't tell you what I'm looking at. But I think I described it a minute ago. And there he is again. There's his equipment again after he upgraded a little bit. How do you guys like that printer, that computer, or that printer, that red printer there in the center of the room there? <laughs> Kathy's telling me that's a typewriter. You sure that's not a, a computer? Back 1960 computer? Okay. Anyway, I was making a joke. I have, I have to tell Kathy. All right, so there, there's, uh, there's uh, Dan Caesar's uh, vintage station, and he sent me a couple QSL cards. Uh, here's a friend of mine, uh, uh, Gary, uh, sent in this picture. This is uh, Gary, uh, AJ4GL, uh, sent in a picture um, of some surplus rig that was given to him in 1975. He didn't have a rig at the time. This is some type military transmitter. If you look on the left uh, half, the left third there, you'll see a crystal right in the center. And of course, all of us novices were crystal control. Uh, Gary said the, right, the rig did work. So does anybody know what kind of rig that is? Uh, that's the question for tonight. Help us identify, uh, identify what type of rig that might be there. And let's uh, move on. Uh, another friend of mine, uh, that I worked uh, 50 years ago, uh, Johnny uh, Royster, WA4VEK, uh, sent in these pictures of some nice uh, uh, night kits. Now, the, the box on the left is the T150 transmitter. It was a kit. The box on the right is an R100, I think it's an R100 receiver, a night kit. Uh, that was my first transmitter. Uh, I built that and uh, used, uh, used that as my first transmitter. It was a 150-watt transmitter. It went 80 through 6 meters. It worked AM, and it worked CW, and it did have a VFO in it. But if you look just on the right side below the VFO, you'll see a crystal socket, and that's where we had to put our crystal sockets in there. Uh, let's see. Let's, uh, let's move on. I'm hoping... Hoping I've got these in the right order. Okay, I do. I'll just throw mine in there very quickly. You can see the T150 uh, night kit transmitter right there on the right at my right arm, and uh, that's what uh, that's what I started off with. Although back then it was very easy to build your own transmitter, and I built uh, several uh, transmitters from uh, scratch. Um. Uh, and then uh, a friend of mine, Gary Howard, uh, who was uh, WN5KZK, uh, sent me these pictures right here. Uh, Gary, I talked to him. Uh, I think I, I might have been one of his first contacts, or, or he was one of my first contacts. Here's a friend of his uh, in Murfreesboro, Arkansas, and you learn a lot of neat things from these old QSL cards. For instance, Murfreesboro, Arkansas is the home of the only diamond mines in the United States. And there's a picture of uh, Larry, WN5LOM, and that's his station right there. Looks like it's, uh, he's got a DX40 transmitter. I can't quite make out the, uh, I can't quite make out the receiver there. But look at that vintage reel-to-reel uh, -reel tape recorder above there on the second shelf. So that's, uh, that's kind of cool. Okay, so that's our uh, part on, uh, on vintage tonight. Uh, I would love to have you guys send me any pictures, any comments that we can put on the, the vintage uh, portion of our, uh, of our webcast. Uh, let me see if I can get our guest on here real quick.
trying to get Dan Air. I don't think we got Dan. Dan is offline. Okay, now Dan may have not made it in. Uh, uh, Dan uh, N9 LBS is uh, also a friend, and he had put together a couple videos for the show tonight uh, on Android uh, apps for ham radio and also Apple apps for ham radio. And there are a lot of great apps. For, for example, uh, I use uh, I used to use APRS in the truck, and when we would go to Dayton, you guys would say, hey, it hadn't updated for 50 miles, 60 miles. So what I did is I uh, downloaded the uh, Droid app for, uh, it's called Droid APRS. And that lets my phone now send out uh, APRS positions uh, to the system. And uh, you, don't miss, uh, you don't miss anything. You'll get them every mile there. So that's what we'll be using uh, in our next travels is is the uh, APRS uh, droid. So I'm going to go ahead. Uh, Dan is not here, but I've got Dan's uh, program material here. I'm going to go ahead and run it very quickly, and uh, and we'll get that uh, run. And maybe Dan can join us by the time the, the, the videos are over. So here we go. This is a droid apps for, uh, for ham radio. This is Android apps for amateur radio. In this short little video, I'm going to go over seven applications for amateur radio. As you can see from the list in the Google Play Store, there are many others. Let's start out with Ham Test Prep. With this app, you can get your amateur radio license. This app has a whole question pool right in it. It can give you sample tests for technician, general, and extra. It also keeps track of what questions you've mastered. From the main screen, you can decide whether you want to take a practice test or just study the exam itself. For instance, this screen shows you all 10 elements. This is a great study guide for the exam. Here's an example of what a test question will look like. At the end of the exam, it will show which questions you've missed and their exact reference number. Next, we go on to Repeater Book. Repeater Book uses the GPS in your phone as well as a repeater directory to determine which repeaters are closest to you, as well as the distance from the repeater. Repeater Book can also Bluetooth to many newer radios. On this screen we can see W7ZA, the 2 meter repeater, is 7.4 miles away, as well as KA7, DNK, is 7.4 miles away on UHF. We can also set what repeaters we want to see, for instance 70 centimeters, 2 meters, 1.2 meters, and 6 meters. It does use automatic location from your GPS to get the best list for you. Now on to QRZ. This is a great call sign lookup application. You'll basically see all the information you'd expect to see from a regular QRZ page, as well as a recently found area and an area to share that data. I use it as a mobile log. Now here's APRS Droid, a neat little client get your feet wet on APRS. This screen shows the activity for APRS in your area. APRS Droid also has a map for more detailed information. One thing that's pretty neat is you can actually send messages with APRS Droid. Now one thing that APRS Droid does require is that you have your APRS-IS passcode, which you can easily get from several locations. Echolink is another neat little app. It lets you get on the Echolink system. You can join conferences if you want. You can look up by area and connect directly to a repeater. You can also connect to the test server so you can test your audio level into the repeaters and conferences. And then it's just a matter of transmitting. There are also numerous DX cluster applications. This one is NKC Cluster. It has your standard DX window as well as more information about the DX spot. There's also filters to filter out either the band or the mode that you want to use. And last but not least, we have antenna tool. All you have to do with this guy is type in the frequency and it'll tell you how long to build the antenna. It can give you dimensions for dipoles, verticals, inverted V's, quad loops, delta loops, and yagis. For verticals, it gives you the dimensions all the way from an eighth inch vertical all the way up to a full wave vertical. And for inverted V's, it gives you multiple information, not just the size of the legs, as well as a lot of information on the delta loop. There are also many applications that have ham radio tools on them as well that I didn't go over on this video as well as some applications from the ARRL, including the regular ARRL application, the QSC application, and their Logbook of the World application. I hope this video has been helpful, and 73s from N9LBS. Okay, that was a uh, good little video there from, uh, from Dan, N9LBS, uh, discussing the, uh, the Droid apps for ham radio. Uh, there's there's a lot of them out there now for you guys that are Apple and I know there's some of you guys out there that are Apple guys We're going to go ahead and uh, know it's about a two-minute video. He's going to talk about Apple uh, apps for, uh, for ham radio This 
Apple iOS apps for amateur radio. In this video, we're going to talk about apps that you can use for your iOS device. This is the iTunes Store. As you can see when we look up amateur radio, there are a lot more apps available. Let's start out with Hamtask Prep. This is a study guide application that gives you a full list of questions in the question pool. From the main menu, you can also take practice exams or see your test history. It also gives you a complete breakdown of Part 97. When you take a practice exam, it'll look like this. And when you've completed your exam, you'll get a nice proficiency percentage from the exam. Next, let's look at QRZ for Apple. When we look up W1AW, we get all the information we'd expect to see from the standard QRZ page. We can also see its location, and if we want, we can actually see a standard QRZ page. Then there's Repeater Book, a nice little application that finds repeaters that are close to you. For instance, the AH6LE repeater is only 0.9 miles away. And as we scroll down the list, we see that the N7ASM repeater is only 4.8 miles away. If we click on the repeater listing, we get all the particulars about that repeater. There's also filters that we can select which repeaters we will see, as well as which modes we want to use. You can also set auto location. That way you only see the repeaters that are nearest to you. We also have Open APRS, a nice little APRS app. From the main screen on the app, it gives you a working compass, as well as access to all the app's features. This area here gives you your exact location, as well as some of the setup features. We can also do a search and see when the last time one of our fellow hams was on, as well as the ability to message back and forth. We're also able to look people up on a map as well. There's also an Echolink app. This is very similar to what you'd see on your desktop. First thing that you're going to want to do is make sure that the connection to Echolink is working. All you have to do is log into the test server and then transmit some audio and listen to it back. Then, while well, you need to pick a country that you want to talk to. From that list, you'll see everybody in that country that's on Echolink. Once you've connected, you'll get a screen that looks like this. This tells you everybody that's on that node. Then all you have to do is click transmit and you're in the conversation. And let's not forget iCluster, a neat little app to catch spots in the DX cluster. From the main page, you'll see all the current DX spots and who sent that spot. If you click on one of the spots, you'll come up to this page, which gives the spotting details, as well as the information from the herd station. You can also connect to numerous different DX clusters. There's also an area for alerts and filters. You can filter by band, by mode, by zone, and by call. This app also has a very nice link to QRZ. And last but not least, Ham Antenna Calculator for iOS. This antenna app is set up to work either English or metric and can calculate eighth wave, quarter wave, half wave, five eighths wave, or a full wave antenna. You just punch in your frequency and it comes up with the length. In this case, for a dipole, it's telling us what a half wave length is and what a quarter wave length is. It can do the same for the inverted V, where it calculates the inverted V for either 20 degrees, 32 degrees, or 45 degrees, as well as calculating for a vertical, where it gives our vertical length as well as our radial length. The iTunes App Store has a lot of amateur radio apps that are available. This video is just to give you a quick look at what's available for ham radio in the App Store. I hope this video has been helpful. And 7 threes from N9 LVS. Okay, uh, well, if you'll notice, I've changed rooms. I'm now in the ham shack. All right, guys. Uh, I just I forgot I was going to send a link out earlier to you about the uh, Hangout where you can get on the show now. I just sent the link out. It should work. If you'll click on that link, if you've got Google Plus and click on that link, uh, you can join us and be on the show. So the, uh, the organized part of the show basically is over now. And this is what we call the roundtable where we're going to let all you guys out there be on the show. Your video is going to come on the webcast. You can enter interact with other people and talk. We can have up to 10 videos uh, on at the same time. And you'll see how it works. Now, if you if you get on Hangout, if you try to come in remotely, uh, please turn down the volume on, on this webcast video because it's delayed and we don't want two different audios happening. So if you come in on, uh, if you come in on that link, uh, please uh, click on the little speaker under the video and turn the video down. So people, if you will, click on that link. I'm going to see if I can get on here. Um, it's going to take me a second to get on. And uh, uh, let's see. Okay. I may have uh, clicked the wrong button here. 
Oh, we're looking okay. So let me uh, let me see if I can get on here with you guys. Oh, we've got somebody joining us. There we go. We've got we've got a second person. How you doing there? Uh, that's old Glenn Popel. Hey, stranger. Oh, let me get off me so the picture will, will swap over. Okay, there we go. Up. Oh, all right. So there you go, Glenn. Now you're on the webcast. Okay. Yeah. Folks, this is Glenn Popel. You may have seen him on one of the earlier webcasts that we had. Uh, Glenn is the author of the book Arduino for Home Radio, and uh, it was published recently by the ARRL. Hearing a little bit of feedback. Uh, Glenn, are you hearing me okay? Yeah, I'm hearing you fine. Okay, great, great. Okay, well, we found we have two people that found out how to get into the show. Uh, let's just give it another minute or so. Hey, uh, when's your next book going to come out? Ha <laughs> Yeah, right. Uh, I haven't even really been doing a whole lot. I've been too busy getting snowed in and catching up. Hey, speaking of snowed in, Kathy, what did you say on the forecast? One to three inches are coming again. What, when? Tomorrow? Tomorrow. Tomorrow afternoon. It seems like every uh, three days we have ice and snow coming through here. It's been going on for about two weeks now. Yeah, I mean, the schools have been closed for over a week now, so I have to work out of the house. But, uh, you know, I'm just falling further and further behind. Uh huh. So, uh, hey, let me turn back over to Rick here. Rick, uh, you. Uh, you're a big uh, digital guy, aren't you? I mean, D-Star right. and everything, right? Right. Are there any D-Star nets or anything you'd like to announce? or? Well, on uh, Thursday evenings, I call the CERT D-Star net, the nationwide net, which is on Refactor 67 Bravo, and also on W4C, no B-repeater.